Undeniable, Part 6. We've been looking at the book Undeniable by Douglas Sachs, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life Is Designed. It's a subtitle uh, printed this year uh, by HarperCollins. There's the uh, cover of it. And uh, uh, he has a summary of the book, and I'm going to shorten that summary somewhat. So you get an overview. Douglas Axe argues that the key to understanding our origins is the design intuition. The innate belief held by all humans, the tasks we would need knowledge to accomplish can only be accomplished by someone who has that knowledge. For the ingenious task of inventing life, this knower can only be God. There is science that proves our design intuition is valid. Everyday experience can o empower ordinary people to defend their design intuition. Living creatures are brilliantly conceived, utterly beyond the reach of accident. In chapter one, he asked the big question. What is the source from which everything else came? Or to bring it closer to home, to what or to whom? Do we owe our existence? Skipping down a little bit, um, we're going to be in chapter 10, and so this is his summary of what he intends to show in chapter 10. But all of this only tells us what the answer to our question isn't. To arrive at a satisfying understanding of what the answer is, will require us to continue our journey a bit further. In chapter 10, we will revisit the question of what life is, viewing it this time through the lens of invention. So that's how he sees chapter 10, and now we will begin chapter 10. Coming alive. The conflict within has been resolved. The tug of war between our design intuition and the consensus view of biological or origins has been won by our intuition. Handily so. As hoped, the win was not by the strength of technical science, though this certainly pulled for the winning side, but by the strength of common science. Reasoning and observations we can trust because they're so closely connected to what we know from experience. As significant as all this is, it hasn't yet given us a satisfactory answer to our big question, to what or to whom do we owe our existence? We have only a vague answer. We know we shouldn't wake up every morning thinking either natural selection or blind repetition for our lives. We know we weren't hatched by any egg hunt search, which means we aren't the offspring of any accidental causes at all. This makes purpose a key ingredient of our origin, and perhaps many of us would be content to leave it at that. Thomas Nagel has convinced me that we should go further. As an atheist, he seeks to quote, explain the experience, uh, appearance of life, consciousness, reason, and knowledge, neither as accidental side effects of the physical laws of nature, nor as the result of intern, intentional intervention in nature from without, but as an unsurprising, if not inevitable, consequ consequence of the order that governs, governs the natural world from within. Sort of, I guess, a pantheist type of view. Because our main accomplishment to this point has been to rule out the accidental cause that Nagel rejects, he would agree with us, so far anyway. On the one hand, I view his agreement up to this point as a good thing, considering the quality of his thinking. On the other hand, because my purpose in this book has been to identify the source from which we came, I want you to notice that um, although intelligent design officially does not... Uh, agree with theism, you, very clearly Doug Axe, who is one of the major players, does believe in theism and does believe that it's important. I, as a Christian thinker, will feel as though I've come up short if an atheist thinker can be in agreement the whole way, even in an exceptional atheist thinker like Nagel. We need to press on with the aim of reaching a more clear understanding of this non-accidental source from which we came an understanding that fits either Nagel's view of an impersonal power within nature or my view of a personal power outside of nature, but not both. 
These next four chapters of our journey will provide the understanding naturally, this understanding naturally without being overtly forced to that end. We'll also address the most common reasons for doubling our con doubting our conclusion that the design intuition has won. Both of these aims call for a closer look at life than we were ready for in chapter six, benefiting now from our refined understanding of invention. This chapter will serve that purpose. Taking invention to a whole new level. However artfully humans have harnessed the regularities of the universe, fashioning the elements into things like smartphones and space telescopes, we can't escape the realization that someone has outdone us. The busy spider, the heroic salmon, the graceful orca, indeed all of the living masterpieces that surra uh, surround us demonstrate that physical materials and processes can be put to use much more elegantly than we ever have. Mind you, I say this as a lifelong technophile, not at all to disparage human invention, but rather to remind us that life occupies a category that is unquestionably above human invention. For example, among the more advanced products of human technology is a solar-powered underwater vehicle called Tavros 2. Operated by the University of South Florida, Tavros 2 was designed to conduct month-long missions in the Gulf of Mexico, measuring and reporting water depth and temperature. What makes this vehicle particularly sophisticated is that it operates autonomously under the complete control of its outboard computer, onboard computer. A uh, Tavros 2 is programmed to rise to the surface when it needs a solar recharge, after which it dives to its previous location and resumes data collection. If this aquatic robot had a resume, GPS navigation would be listed under the technical skills heading, and tweeting would be under other interests, this being how it sends data back to the scientists at the marine lab, or to anyone else who likes to follow nerdy tweets. But try comparing Tavros 2 with something like living dolphins. Being roughly the same size might seem uh, something living, I'm sorry. Dolphins being roughly the same size might seem to be, seem like a suitable species for comparison. But no sooner do we begin in the exercise than we realize how incomparable these two inventions are. Like all robots, Tavros 2 does exactly what it's programmed to do, whereas dolphins seem to do whatever they want to do. Uh, one is a physical machine, while the other is, by all appearances, something profoundly greater than that, something beyond the mere physical. In chapter 13, we'll explore the significance of this profound difference. For now, though, let's continue to concentrate on the physical aspects of living things, aspects that resemble machines, albeit machines of a most remarkable kind. We'll see that the machinery of life displays functional coherence on a scale that's presently beyond human comprehension to say nothing of human imitation. High-tech pond scum. We'll start with a living machine, by which I mean a form of life that, unlike dolphins, appears to operate in an entirely physical way. For simpler, uh, far simpler than any of the individual cells within a dolphin is a lowly form of aquatic microbial life called cyanobacteria. Although cyanobacteria are single-celled organisms, the individuals of some species adhere to one another to form long filaments that interweave into huge mat-like colonies in stagnant or slow-moving water. They are quite literally the pond scum of the earth. Despite uh, occupying that humble position in the grand scheme of life, cyanobacteria are light years ahead of Tavros II in terms of their technical sophistication. To see this, let's do some comparing and contrasting. One notable similarity is that Tavros II and cyanobacteria are both solar powered. However, when we examine this feature in more detail, we find that the two aren't really comparable. The non-living machine is a solar collector the size of a coffee table, whereas the living one does very well with a collector roughly one trillionth of that size. And while the non-living machine has only one trick for getting sunlight surfacing, the living one is capable of much more. Filamentous cyanobacteria do control their depth in response to sunlight, but they're also able to coordinate complex sliding and oscillating movements to make their entire colony face toward the sunlight. So in terms of sophistication of movement for capturing sunlight, cyanobacteria have Tavros II beat hands down, or 
may be filaments down. The contrast becomes even more extreme when we consider the manufacturing capabilities. Tavros II has none. Whereas every cyanobacterium houses an entire manufacturing plant within its microscopic walls. Although we think of photosynthesis as a natural process in the sense that it's happening all around us in nature, in another sense, it is very unnatural. To grasp this, think of photosynthesis as the reverse of burning fuel, because that's what it amounts to. Burning is a very natural process, whereas unburning is not. The challenge for me is to give a sense of this without giving the equivalent of two or three chapters of textbook biochemistry. But, and I'm skipping over some of the stuff he says, but you don't have to do any in-depth study to be fully convinced that Photosystem I is an ingenious nanotechnological invention. All you have to do is let the diagrams speak for themselves. And here's the parts. Um, vitamin K, relatively small. Beta carotene, also relatively small compound. Chlorophyll A, relatively small compound, but you have to make it. And sulfur cluster, I don't know who is spelling sulfur, but... Um, um, and then a bunch of proteins, except for this lipid. Um, if you'll notice that this probably has, I don't know, 20 or 30 amino acids at least. This one probably has hundreds. This one also hundreds. All of these, you know, well over 100. And you have to make three of each one of them. And each amino acid is a construction project in itself. And then you agglomerate them into antenna system, electron transfer for chain, and a bunch of other stuff. And of course, the complete photosystem is just, you know, it's probably comparable to an aircraft carrier or more. The very fact that the terms electron transfer chain and antenna system are used by the scientists who study photosystem one tells us that this photosystem's overall function involves multiple subfunctions, including the transfer of electrons and the collection of photons by an antenna. If you, try, if you do decide to delve into the technical literature, you'll find a host of other functional descriptors, including docking site, primary electron donor, initial electron acceptor, and quenching carotenoids. All nice technical names for complicated things. Even if most of us have no clue what these terms mean, we see that the high-level function of the photosystem one depends on an extensive hierarchy of lower functions. And that should seem very familiar. This is another example of hierarchical functional coherence made particularly striking by the tiny scale in which it's been implemented. As always, we immediately perceive this pattern to a, be a signature of purposeful invention. As complex as Photosystem One is, it's only one component of the many that make up the whole of photo, the photosynthetic system. Figure 10.4, which we'll see in a minute, um, gives us an idea of how complex this whole system is. The figure is arranged in a hierarchical structure that should remind you of Figure 9.3, with branches. Topping the hierarchy is the cyanobacterial cell, shown as an actual cross-sectional image taken with an electron microscope. Below that is the photosynthetic system, which, though it is shown alone, is just one of many systems needed to support the top-level function of, the living, of living life as a cyanobacterial cell. And keep in mind, this is just one system. This is like showing the respiratory system in a human. Um, at the next level down, this photosynthetic system is composed of two components, the thiocolloid membrane system and the CO2 concentrating and reacting system. The first of these is responsible for harvesting light energy and converting this into chemical energy. The second is responsible for using this chemical en energy to unburn CO2. The major uh, structures associated with both of these component systems are large enough to be visible in the image at the top. The concentric bands seen around the perimeter of the cell are the layers of light-catching thiocolloid membrane. The dark, large dark spots inside the cell are the carboxysomes, the reaction vessels in which the unburning takes place. And there's the diagram. And you can see 
thylakoid membrane all around, around the cell with, and then the carboxysomes, big carboxysome with all kinds of little parts that have to go, and each one of those parts is terribly complicated. And then remember our photosystem one that had, you know, dozens of components? Well, it's part of photosystem one, photosystem two, you know, just multiple different, uh, inclu including ATP uh, synthase. You have to have all of that stuff in order to just get the, chem the light energy turned into chemical energy. And then the chemical energy has to be transferred to different kind of chemical energy in order to pull carbon dioxide out of the water and uh, reduce it to a form of carbon that's more useful to the cell. Just amazing. All of these functions require exquisite... Oh, and we haven't talked about the nucleus or you know, the oscillating systems and all that kind of stuff. All these functions required exquisite technical sophistication. The thylakoid membrane, for example, forms compartments that are so well sealed that even a tiny proton, a hydrogen ion stripped of it, atom stripped of its electron, can't pass through the barrier except by going through a sophisticated protein channel that systematically moves it from one side to the other. Some of these channels, photosystem two and the cytochrome B6F complex, act like tiny pumps forcing protons from the low pressure side of the compartment to the high pressure side. While another ATP synthase acts as a turbine, extracting energy by allowing protons to flow the other way. This is just a snapshot of the complexity of photosynthesis. Volumes have been written on the subject, and as amazing as the functional coherence represented in figure 10.4 is, it becomes even more amazing when we consider the highest level of the hierarchy, where many of the functions coalesced into one purpose. From this top level advantage point, we see that photosynthesis, for all its stunning sophistication, is only one of the major functions needed for cyanobacteria to fulfill their purpose of being cyanobacteria. Ultimately, all the molecular assembly lines inside a cyanobacterial cell and all their associated genes and regulatory circuits do what they do in, or, in order for cyanobacteria to take their place among the spectacular living inventions that surround us, each so good that they cannot be other than what they are. When viewed through this lens, photosynthesis is one of those exquisite smaller inventions that serves its higher purpose so well as to make itself almost invisible. And if the ability of cyanobacteria to make sugar from sunlight, air, and water has our eyes popping and jaws dropping, as indeed it should, try to imagine a proportionate response to the fact that they also make cyanobacteria out of those same raw materials. It boggles the mind. We're left to think that poor Tavros too is really no more worthy of comparison to a lowly cyanobacterium than it is to an exalted dolphin. After all, raw natural ingredients like sand and metal ores and crude oil became Travros too, only with the skillful help of thousands of people at hundreds of industrial plants in, of various kinds. With all due respect, this human invention does very little in comparison to the human effort expended to manufacture it. The contrast with cyanobacteria could hardly be more stark. Coherence on steroids. The cyanobacterium proves itself to be a dizzyingly impressive busy hole by accomplishing a dizzyingly impressive whole project, the manufacture of cyanobacteria, with apparent ease. And if that is so, then the toiling spider and the heroic salma, salmon and the elegant orca can hardly be anything less. The sense of awe and wonder stirred in us by the humble cyanobacterium is only the beginning. To leave you with a taste of the elegant complexity underlying familiar aspects of higher life, I have in figure 10.5, which I've omitted for this talk, traced uh, one branch of the mammalian visual system from the top of its functional hierarchy down to the level of small molecules. Again, the point is merely to see the complex functional hierarchy that supports vision without having to understand it. Everything in an orca is completely and exquisitely devoted to the top-level purpose of being an orca. Every cell in the body both sustains the body and is sustained by the body. Living inventions are therefore all-or-nothing holes, utterly committed to being what they are. 
The body is alive and thriving when all its parts are working, or it is dead and decaying when they are not. Apart from humans and the animals we tend to, nothing lingers very long between those polar extremes. Cars and smartphones and pool robots are not nearly so unified in their operation. They do fail when a key component fails, but in most cases the remaining components are unaffected by that failure. The reason for this is that humans don't manufacture all or nothing holes. Although they kind of do, if, you know, failure. Instead, we manufacture things part by part and then assemble the parts into a whole. Each part is made and tested independently according to its own specifications. And indeed, many of these continue to be tested and replaced periodically even after they're incorporated into a whole. Life is nothing like that. Somehow, almost unbelievably, living inventions play a key role in building and maintaining themselves. All their parts formed and knitted together in unison within the whole. Life is never anything but whole. The mind boggles. Skipping a little bit. Making sense with amino acids. We've seen from the laboratory experiments discussed in chapter 6 and 7 that uh, X did himself. The Darwin's molecular fiddler is not at all adept in inventing new proteins. And in this chapter, we've seen how deeply functional coherence runs through biological systems built from proteins. Until now, these may have seemed like separate problems for blind evolutionary searches. The problem of finding new proteins and the problem of finding helpful inventions that use proteins. In fact, the root problem in both cases is the impossibility of finding the necessary functional coherence by blind searches because proteins as molecular inventions exhibit impressive fun functional coherence in themselves. Figure 10.6 helps us to understand what functional coherence means in the context of a single protein chain. The value of ribbon diagrams like the one shown on the left side, and I'm going to show this for you in a minute, is that we can see where the chain forms either of the two regular conformations that characterize all folded proteins, alpha helices, shown as coils, or beta strands, shown as arrows. But that visual clarity comes at the cost of oversimplification, as a more physically accurate stick representation on the right shows. Among the sticks, we can, with some effort, discern a jagged version of the graceful path traced out by the ribbon on the left. But we also see what appears to be a messy jumble of darkly colored appendages jutting out from that path in all directions. Believe it or not, the functional coherence of this protein lies within that complex jumble. And the same goes for every other folded protein. And there's their fold the protein and you can see the alpha helix at the top, you can see the beta sheets here, and here they've overlaid it with what that stick diagram actually looks like. And you can see, you look at the stick diagram and it looks all kind of confused, there's order in there. It's just very, very complex order. The different appendages types are what distinguish the 20 amino acids. What looks like a mess to us is really an exquisite arrangement of amino acid appendages along the whole protein that coaxes what would otherwise be a long floppy chain into forming a stable three-dimensional structure. Arranged sequentially in that special way, the appendages are more comfortable fitting snugly into their folded conformation than they would be flopping around wildly in the cellular fluid, the way a random sequence of amino acids does. Without their snugly folded conformation, the proteins of life couldn't perform their vital functions. Just how exquisite are the arrangements of amino acids that cause protein chains to fold then? This is what I set out to measure with the experiment pro experimental project I described at the start of chapter 5. My aim in that work was to measure how improbable functional coherence is for these amino acids in much the same way we assess this for letters and pixels in chapter 9. I started by making lots of little variants of weakly functional penicillin and activating enzymes I described back in chapter 7. The one that could be optimized by selection because it was already working as an actual enzyme. In each variant, a group of 10 appendages that formed a cluster, as shown in figure 10.7, was replaced with random alternatives. If you want the full details, look at the book. You can think of the appendages within these clusters as being like letters or pixels in groups. The bottom level parts must work together to form, produce something coherent. The idea was to assess this coherence by finding out how hard it is for a random assortment of appendages to be as functionally coherent as the appendages they replaced. 
meaning just coherent enough for the enzyme to work at perhaps less than a thousandth of what its original function was. <coughs> Once this was determined experimentally for the four clusters shown, the next step was to calculate the improbability of evolution stumbling upon that minimal functional coherence, not just for th in these four clusters, but in all the clusters needed for the protein to fold. I did this by converting the fraction of mutants that worked in each of the four experiments into an average probability of functional coherence per amino acid. I then multiplied this to give an estimate to estimate the likelihood of a fully randomized gene having the functional coherence needed to form a structure that supports enzyme functions. As I said at the beginning of chapter 5, the result was striking. Of the possible genes encoding protein chains, 153 amino acids in length, which is relatively small protein, only about 1 in 100 trillion, 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 trillion is expected to encode a chain that folds well enough to form a biological function. So as hard as it was for our noise-seeking robot in Chapter 7 to find a stadium, finding a biological invention is much harder, even at the low level of a single protein. We estimated that stadium noise may cover one part in 100,000 of the Earth's surface, but the result here paints a much bleaker picture. Instead of the Earth's surface for a search space, try picturing a sphere the size of the visible universe, 28 billion light years in diameter. And instead of a target that covers 6,000 square kilometers, try picturing one the size of a hydrogen atom. Now that's a target we can safely write off as lost in space. Invention top to bottom. As convinced I am that, a protein, that protein folds are ingenious inventions in themselves, I don't want to give the impression that all of life's genius resides in proteins. Clearly it doesn't. As should be clear from pig, figures 10.4 and 10.5, the clever arrangement of amino acids to, work, to form working proteins is just one aspect of the exquisite design of life and one that occupies a relatively low position in the functional hierarchy at that. But while the invention of new life forms is undoubtedly a loftier exercise than the invention of new protein folds, that lofty exercise seems to require mastery of the lower level exercise. One of the great surprises to come from the genome sequencing project is how many unique genes and therefore proteins are present in each form of life, including forms that to us look only subtly different. For example, a group of German scientists recently examined the genome sequences from 16 cyanobacterial strains in an effort to discern, discern all the distinct kinds of genes these strains carry. 16 different ones, they just sequenced them and compared. Since they're all cyanobacteria, you might think they would carry the same set of genes, with perhaps an extra gene here, a missing gene there. The scientists found that they do share a common set of 660 genes, meaning that not that these genes are identical from one strain to the next, but rather that they are similar enough that we can be quite certain they encode proteins that fold to the same overall structure and perform the same biological function. Much more surprising, though, was their finding that nearly 14,000 genes are unique to individual strains. At an average of 869 unique genes per strain, this makes these bacterial strains more genetically different than alike, despite their overall external similarities. The proportion of species-specific genes varies from one species to the next, but their existence in large numbers seems to be a property of all life, not just cyanobacteria. To quote the abstract from a recent technical paper, comparative genome analysis indicate that every taxonomic group so far studied every taxonomic group so far studied contains 10 to 20 percent of genes that lack recognizable homologs in other species. That is huge, to quote a presidential candidate. Um, and think about it. We have, what, uh, 20,000 genes, more or less, in humans? That means 
1,000 to 2,000 new genes, brand new genes in humans. And every other species that's been examined. In other words, every species has many genes that seem at first glance to be one-offs, unlike any gene found anywhere else. The painstaking work of finding the structures of the proteins these genes encode is showing that about two-thirds turn out to be to, not, to resemble previously known proteins, with the remaining third being genuinely new. So, you know, well, maybe it's not 2,000. Maybe it's really 600. But these are totally brand new. And, well, um, we have a comment back there. Uh, who, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the thing that's interesting is that, you know, some of those other genes, they're 30% alike, which is way past chance. But that means you have 70% difference. The origin of new categories of life does therefore seem to require the origin of new genes and proteins. Again, this isn't at all hard to, to say that the two are equivalent, but only that one entails the other. You can't get one without the other. With profound implications. Just as mastery of spelling and vocabulary is only the first step towards mastering writing, so too mastery of protein design is only a basic step towards mastering the design of life. And this isn't even mastering protein design. This is just making sure they fold properly. That doesn't count making sure that they have an enzyme uh, center that can do uh, fancy things uh, biochemically. The fact that mastery of this basic step is completely beyond the reach of blind evolution is therefore evolution's undoing. In the end, to believe the evolutionary story is to believe something much less plausible than hitting the cosmic Kuna target, an atomic dot, on a universe-sized sphere, over and over in succession, by blindly dropping subatomic pins. No one should believe that. The fruits of common science. When what we have deduced to be true of inventions generally that they cannot happen by accident is all the more true of the particularly remarkable inventions we see in life. What we realized at the end of the previous chapter, that omelets are completely lost within the space of kitchen possibilities. We can now extend to protein molecules within the space of amino acid possibilities. And what is true for proteins is all the more true for the higher systems that use proteins for functions like photosynthesis and vision, and still more true for the whole organisms, whole organisms occupying that highest level where the many functions coalesce into one purpose. Just as instructions and poems and love letters are completely absent from the mountains of quarty gibberish that can be assessed by blind searches, so it is with life. To do this activity we call living is so remarkable a feat that it can only be done by something extraordinarily well conceived and fashioned. Each and every new form of life must therefore be a masterful invention in its own right, embodying its own distinctive version of functional coherence at the very highest level. It can only, I can only see these ingenious creeping, climbing, swimming, soaring, blooming, burrowing, luring, lunging, spinning, sporulating, fleeing, and fighting inventions as having come from the mind of God. To me, nothing else makes any sense. That each one occupies its own unique place in our minds must surely reflect the fact that they were given their own place in the workshop, workshop of that supreme mind. There's no room for nonsense there, no thought of one masterpiece smearing into another as if brilliant ideas could be blended like paint. That we have been chosen to behold the living wonders of that workshop ought to astound us, the keepers of our own workshops where we labor over much smaller projects. That we came from that workshop should astound us all the more. Among all the wonders that make Earth their home, we alone are compelled to stop and stare, to take this whole spectacle in, five parts inspiring to one part troubling, and to ponder it, knowing that none of it is accidental. The children have been right all along. 
And my take is, it seems to me that in this chapter, is this chapter rather than the previous one, that Darwinian ev evolution is shown to be untenable. A plausible, in my opinion, compelling argument has been made previously by Axe that one, natural selection can't create. All it can do is select from what's already created. Two, objects that are fantastically improbable are, as he put it, physically impossible. You can't search through all the space in the lifetime of the universe, even in an extended lifetime of the universe. Three, it is fantastically improbable that random mutations could create the life forms that we see, which is generally accepted. What happens is people like Dawkins take, reference, uh, take refuge in the idea that there is such a thing as stepping stones. And now, Axe destroys the last refuge of evolution, the stepping stone theory. In previously reported experiments, he shows how surprisingly narrow the stepping stones are, um, although they were done after some of this stuff. But now he notes that over half of each cyanobacterium's proteins are specific to it. And remember, this doesn't count proteins in the same protein family that are 40% similar and thus 60% different. Those are counted as the same. The idea of increasing advantageous stepping stones to one brand new protein by itself strains credulity, let alone to 860 of them per cyanobacterial species. Even if that's an overestimate, and it's really not 860, but it's more like uh, 290, it's still amazing. And there is no experimental evidence for this stepping stone thing. Darwinian evolution fails, let alone the spontaneous origin of life. That's important. There are only the multiple universes theory and the anti-God arguments to try to rescue materialism to from total failure and for some kind of theism to triumph. We will see these arguments in later chapters. For now, I think Axe has done the heavy lifting. Life looks designed because it was designed. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Well, I mean, one can only uh, marvel at what has been presented here. And Quinlan can realize how much has been left out that could have been presented. It's uh, it's a convinc very convincing case, of course. Uh, I think referred to slightly uh, <clears throat> his examples at the beginning, you know, of uh, well, smartphone and so on. Man has created. Uh, is totally unnecessary, and he made that one sentence you mentioned to him there, totally unnecessary because uh, so man can make smartphones. We're, we're asking that this occur without any intelligence, which is a whole different game. Well, I, his point is not so much that man can make smartphones and <clears> therefore <throat> man could make life, no, he just used them as examples. He, what he's saying is that <clears throat> man can make smartphones, but nature can't. And you're trying to tell me that that nature will make cyanobacteria when we can't? Yeah. Well, and of course, you can add to this the, uh, what you referred to at the end. The, uh, how is this going to proceed when... Uh, 
the only mechanism for advancement suggested by, uh, I shouldn't say the only one, at least the main one, is survival of the fittest. And you have to have survival value at every step. Yeah. And all this photosynthesis thing has so many different, uh, it just boggles your mind that you, you could think that this could happen by itself because. Uh, well, a lot of a mind boggling going on right now. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it just stumps you. Uh, well, the origin of life is worse because there's no natural selection to help it out. It's totally random. You have to have, you know, these millions of molecules coming to the same place at the same time. With just the right shape. You've got to select the 20 amino acids that living things have, not all the hundreds of other different kinds of amino acids. Same place, same time, get a cell that works, and that can reproduce. If it doesn't reproduce, you're not going to start life. I mean, this, this, uh, and then of course, he didn't get into DNA, did he? <laughs> I mean, no. In this chapter, I mean, it, and the lipids out there, and it's, it's it's so much more complex than what he presented here. Yeah. But, but For the, every protein, there's a DNA behind it. But this is an outstanding example of uh, a case that's going to make it hard harder for people to not believe in some kind of designer. Well, as he puts it, it's fantastically improbable. <coughs> And, what it, and, and see, if you have a new protein family coming up, that means you can't start with something that was, you know, 90% uh, there already or even 20% there already. You have to start with something that has n no, no relationship whatsoever to the previous proteins or the previous DNA. And, and that just, you know... And every species has that kind of stuff. Yeah. Every species. Now, there are those scientists who will say, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you say we don't have an answer. Where is your God? Well, well come we can come that. to that. But you see, once you start doing that, now you're starting to, you're not arguing from, from, from science anymore. What you, have, what you have betrayed is that this is an anti-theist argument. It is not a scientific argument at all. As soon yes. as you bring theology into it, the claim that this is a scientific uh, argument is all lost. Yeah, you, and uh, you've opened the door. Once you open that door, you're in trouble if you're trying to stay by naturalistic answers. Yeah. The divine foot is now in the door, and the fact that you don't like what the big toe looks like, that's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Yes, a uh, comment here. Oh, George, well, good to have you back. Oh, oh. Did, you, did you want to say something? Go ahead. <clears throat> did you want to say something? Yeah, we, we have a Here's mic here mic. for you. And then I'll Sorry, I was just remembering mm -hmm. that um, when I was in a, a business class, they said that um, something like 80% of all businesses fail in the first two years. If you think about <coughs> uh, businesses that actually do manufacturing, they, they have a factory of some sort, 80% um, of those, bus those businesses fail in the first two years. So it's, it's hard for intelligent beings who know how to design things to get it right 80% of the time, and yet what we see in, uh, at the, even at the cell level is they get it right 100% of the time. Yeah, it is, once you concede that something is fantastically probable without design, then I think that um, that you basically conceded that the most likely thing is a designer. And if you've got a designer and the designer is good enough to make life, 
then the designer is far enough above our capacity that to withhold the name God from that designer is pretty difficult. Yes, we have a comment over here, and uh, George. Yeah, George first, and then... Paul, um, this was beautifully done, <coughs> beautifully written, beautifully presented. Really appreciate that. But these arguments <coughs> are simply a variation of arguing for creationism by complexity. It's taken to a very high level one against which one does not need to argue or cannot argue necessarily. But <clears throat> the term life is being thrown around throughout your presentation without any understanding or any appreciation of what we are talking about. Life, in addition to this complexity, is not just that. In other words, we can take the cyanobacterium apart to pieces and try to reconstitute them and you'll end up with a bunch of inert organic complexes, <sighs> non-living entity. <clears throat> and you know where I'm going with this. Uh, and I've been pushing this and it doesn't seem to make any impact on our thinking that life depends on the chemical reactions being in a non-equilibrium steady state. In other words, <clears throat> which because it's not in equilibrium has to be a very carefully controlled steady state. It has to be instead, but non equilibrium steady state that cannot happen by itself. Non equilibrium steady states do not come about spontaneously, it's impossible. So that <clears throat> underlying everything that you were talking about is the understanding that these chemical reactions are linked, that are driving the cell, and they're dependent on input and the outflow. And that the very existence of living organism can only be explained by a creator who controls, who's able to create non-equilibrium steady states. Complexity or no complexity. It's as if when you created an automobile, <clears throat> it had to have its motor running from the very beginning. With the driver in it, yes, as, as you're <laughs> making it. Yeah, or the airplane that is being produced by the tornado that sweeps to the junkyard. But that airplane, Boeing, has to be flying with the pilot in it in order yeah. to give it the equivalent of, of a living cell. But, but you see, the tornado lifted it up. Mm. And that's how it got to flying to begin with. <laughs> no, the truth of the matter is that, that I think one of the things that is being demonstrated is that this is so clear. Little kids who have been raised as atheists pick it up. That's how clear it is. And um, the denial, the denial is not a scientific denial. The denial is, in fact, a theological denial. God didn't mess with the nature, and therefore, there has to be some other way of explaining it, and this is the best way we can come up with. And, and when you push people like this, the, who have become comfortable enough with that idea, you know, and you'll say, but it couldn't happen, the chances are, you know, one in a gazillion, whatever gazillion is. What their answer will be is, but it happened. Which is, of course, assuming your conclusion to begin with. Because the whole question was, did it happen without help? And to say, but it happened, is assuming that there was no help. And so what's really happening is, it's a theological question at base. And part of what we are trying to do here is to try to clear the air so that people can see that it's really science versus anti-theism. Uh, wait a minute, uh, we have the comment here first. Oh, okay, and then we'll come back. Yes, um, one thing I'd like to emphasize that it takes intelligence 
to observe what's happening with cyanobacteria and to reconstruct these fantastically complex prof, uh, processes. So human intelligence is observing the, the work of an intelligent designer. So we've got to put in the equation our intelligence, which is minuscule compared to the intelligence of the designer, and to look at the whole process. Otherwise, we'd be totally dumb. You know, if we didn't have the intelligence, you know, a moron wouldn't be able to figure out all these processes. And yeah. I wouldn't either, so I put myself in the class <laughs> of a moron. <laughs> in a, well, probably a thousand years, I couldn't. Uh, if we're talking about actually making them, we're all morons. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But the comment I wanted to lead up to is that we've achieved, in, or intelligent design is now at a new level. We're witnessing a new level of intelligent design. I think far beyond Behe. Now, I'm not a biochemist, so maybe people would disagree with me. But Michael Behe, with the mousetrap illustration, is simple enough that I can understand it. Now, we're way beyond it. You know, I can't really comprehend all of this. But the folding and the complexity and talking about burning and unburning and all of this. I'd like to add one more dimension, which I can speak to, since my training is part in geology and part in paleobotany. We're dealing with paleobotany here <laughs> in some ways, cyanobacteria. And probably our wonderful author doesn't even know about the history of cyanobacteria. Now, if you take the rational, secular, geological history, which involves the geological column, the first life on our planet is said to be cyanobacteria. Is that right, Dr. Roth? It's said to be cyanobacteria through stromatolites and these algae. Maybe we can comment on that. There's a lot of confusion there. Uh, I'm not sure cyanobacteria would be the first one. They're close to it, maybe. Yeah. Um, cyanobacteria are known today of creating protective structures around them and building colonies, and these are called stromatolites. So you're br building layer upon layer using both uh, biological processes and also geological. And the structures, in many respects, are quite similar, whether we're talking about hundreds of millions of years ago, if you want to accept that. You don't have to accept that. but before you have complex life, like you have the trilobite with the trilobite eye, very, very complex, before you get to that, you have structures that look like they're created by algae or cyanobacteria. Yeah. Now, if you say that the very first life, or maybe not the first, but some of the first living organisms on Earth are this complex, where did that come from? It raises it to a whole new level. It just might. The word I like the best here is mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a part of the lecture at first I didn't understand, but as you went through, um, the Lord kept showing me what He was saying. Um, in reference to smartphones, now they call them smartphones, I guess meaning that they can think. But anyway, that's a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. But I remember when first cell phones first came out, they were a big block. You would have people carrying a big block on their face around, you know, holding a block up to their ear. And now we and have before cell that they had them uh, had to be in the car because you couldn't carry them around. Right. <laughs> and now they're like this, you know, they're small, they're flat, you can put them anywhere. And so I guess uh, Apple just came out with the new i7, iPhone 7, and it has no, it's like wireless earbuds, but I think you have to wait for that to actually, the earbuds to come. I don't know, I think there's a time. Does anybody know? 
Well, if you had to wait a million years for those earbuds to come, I wonder, would you, you, would you even be alive to get those earbuds? But that's a whole nother story in itself. <laughs> but what I'm finding is that um, this, they took part by part to make a whole. And then they made it smaller, and they called this more efficient. But what we've seen in photo system one of the uh, photosynthesis was that, and it kept stating it again and again in various ways, complex, far more complex structures to perform lower functions. When you zoomed in on photosystem one, it was a part of photosystem two and all that, and it just seemed like it was a part of the membrane. It wasn't even the big picture. It was a part of the membrane, of the thycoloid membrane, it was a lower function compared to the overall function of what it was doing. And so God is showing, and even in nature, you have just in the lower functions more complex things than what is just seen. And so what that tells me is that you don't have just part by part by part, and then the sum of the parts are the whole. You have whole parts, you have complex structures, so you can't just simply break it apart. It's not something that's necessarily additive. You have to have all the parts there, everything working in order for it to be complete. If I don't have everything, it's not gonna work. I can't wait a mother million years for photosystem two to be developed in order for photosystem to work. All of it has to be working together and so it's not something that's additive yeah it would fall apart before yes it would fall apart before it would even uh have its function to take place does that make sense yeah and that's a major problem i pass the mic here but first we have a comment here i think and then we'll come back to you okay. uh, you had a comment didn't you uh, how how many of you heard about the Higgs boson particle? Did, did you remember that when it came out in the newspaper? Um, I I read that article in the paper, and it immediately came to mind that uh, the, these people who did the experiment they weren't sure if the world would end when they did it. Okay. Uh, they did it anyway. He said, eh, it'll be all right. But fortunately, the designer that we serve, some of us, um, kept it that way, I think. But they discovered this particle. They call it the God particle because if it weren't there, all matter would instantly become energy or light. And uh, it holds everything together. Well, uh, I think it was Peter who wrote in the New Testament that in him, that is in Jesus Christ, all things are held together. So there we have it, the physics statement of all physics statements. Uh, valid and the right way to describe the uh, latest discovery that we've made, the Higgs boson particle. So Peter knew what we didn't for thousands of years. <laughs> okay, um, then we'll pass it back to Chan. I'm not a scientist, but I'm very curious. And um, when you were showing the uh, structure and also what we're seeing now reminded me about the Fibonacci uh, particle. The, um, it's the imprint of God. Every single human animal uh, cells have the same Fibonacci uh, shape and it's the imprint of God. And when you were talking that they were 40% similar, 60% not similar, I could see the imprint, the Fibonacci cell. So maybe that's for another topic. Um, 
another thing, uh, one day I was listening to the radio and they were talking about evolution, why we need to uh, believe in evolution. And sometimes I like to hear what evolutionists think because I want to see their thinking process. I want to understand them. And I used to work in Victorville at that time and I had like a 45 minute drive up, 45 minute drive down. So I listened to 40 minutes about <laughs> the evolutionists. There were two uh, PhDs speaking very, very nicely and with excellent English and just one caller one caller said, may I say something? Of course, caller, you can say anything you want. And that was on the 46th minute. And he said, thank you for explaining evolution and uh, mentioning Darwin, as you say, that we humans descend from apes. So if we humans descend from apes, we are the evolved, the evolution of apes. So why do apes exist right now on the planet? Why do monkeys and gorillas, etc., walk the planet? Silence. And you know radio, you can't be silent on radio or TV. So I went, yes, <laughs> I'm so happy. Go ahead, uh, Jan. And then uh, Gilbert. I have a word from the children because I teach nine and 10 year olds in an Adventist school right here at the academy, fourth grade. And the first, the early weeks of school, we spend in creation and um, the early chapters of Genesis. And a typical nine or a 10 year old will take in what a teacher says and accept. I, I resonated with this gentleman at the end of the row here because you mentioned your niece or nephew in a public school. Um, but there are children who think a little higher level who will make comments like, why do I get it and the scientists don't? <laughs> why is this so simple for me? It, you know, I, I had it happen again this year and it's refreshing. But years ago, I went to Barnes and Nobles and I picked out two children's books, evolutionary books, with the monkey and then the ape and you know how man stood up straight and and I leave that out. And every little break that we have during the day, I see the kids going through the book like this, and um, it's it, it's heart sickening to me uh, what's happening in the public sector. And um, I didn't have the privilege of going to a Christian and having to school or a Christian school in my elementary years. But I remember my mother saying to me when I came home and told her about the picture in my science book, uh, well, what do you think about that? She asked me, what do you think about that? I said, well, that doesn't seem right because how could that be? I love that sentence in the book when he says the children have had it right. It is intuitive. It, it, it makes sense to a simple, um, somewhat trusting, because children are trusting. They trust what an adult says to them, generally, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we have stranger danger. We, yeah. we need to have stranger danger. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's Well, it's, in, it's interesting <laughs> because the, the evolutionists are looking at it from the opposite point of view. And they're saying we need to get to the kids early and beat it out of them because, well, and it's happening. Argue it out of them, whatever. You it's know. happening because it's in the it's the pictures are still there yeah. in the millions of years, and yeah. it's uh, because you know until we have more books. Because if you don't tell children anything, even if you do tell children stuff, they look around and they say, "Ooh, that's a neat design. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a neat design," and then. Uh, and they just, they figure it's design. And what's happened is people have tried to persuade them as they get older, mm -hmm. oh, it's not really design. And, and, and what he has just done here is saying, oh, yes, it is. Yeah. And I, I think that it's worth our while to at least have some of that countering what's being thrown at us from our... Uh, 
from our culture because, uh, you know, otherwise we're going to have this. I think we'll always have the conflict because I think people will always look at things and they'll go, that mm -hmm. can't be just an accident. Mm -hmm. That just can't be an accident. I want my students to know what is being taught because they have friends and neighbors. Um, they have friends from church who go to public school. Many of my students this year did not know that that was being taught. And so I think those of us who do teach in Adventist schools, Christian schools, um, I, I would like to see more awareness mm -hmm. and more teaching and, mm -hmm. and allowing children to see both sides so that they're not thrown for a loop later on. Yeah. Um, I think the solution is not less teaching. It's more. Did I say less? No, I meant no. more. No, no. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Did you uh, Gilbert? Well, uh, he didn't say... Uh, put, put your, uh, take your mic, if you will. Thanks. He didn't say specifically. Is this thing on? Yeah, it's working. It's working. Um, but I assume the unburning means that the carbon dioxide is being turned eventually. The plant is a living machine is turning the carbon dioxide, is feeding on that and turning it into oxygen, which we breathe. And then we right. breathe the, right. the uh, uh, carbon dioxide which the plant uses. So it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's so ingenious. It's, uh, you know, it's set there, you, you've got several wells in your mind that. Yeah, there's no way any of us can come anywhere near doing anything like this. Never will. Yeah. And In fact, so one problem. can back it's off one more problem. level and notice that the environment has nitrogen-fixing bacteria and nitrogen-producing produce, organisms and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. It, it's not just at the level of the organism even. It actually goes to the environment that's been designed to work together. Um, I think, Warren, you're next, and uh, uh, George, or are you just holding the mic? I'm just holding the mic. Oh, okay. I'm glad that our friend Gilbert mentioned the unburning part. That was also something I wanted to comment on and put it into a geological context. Now, for those of you who have not studied geology, I never grew up with it because we didn't teach it in elementary school. I think it ought to be taught. In fact, recently it was taught on the academy level, but there were budget cuts, and the one geologist who was teaching it right here locally no longer teaches it, if I understand. But we need it. And here's uh, one thing that you can look at is the geological column, layer upon layer upon layer. Yes. We have but an evidence that things happen rapidly. There's other evidence if we <coughs> stick purely with radi uh, radiometric dating, it looks like it took much longer. Uh, let's look at it through the eyes of the secular geologist that accepts radiometric dating. If you go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon where you start with the trilobites and quotes primitive life, trilobites are not prim primitive, you've got about 530 million years. Now, I'm not advocating it here. What I'm saying, take their time scale, go down through the various layers of the Grand Canyon, and then look at what you find below that. You find cyanobacteria and almost nothing else. Now we have a brilliant argument that we can use in the geological context, that how do you get such complex, little tiny cells of life, so complex, and they're right there at the beginning, the lowest layers, whatever you want to call beginning. We can debate that. Now, here's another wrinkle. You mentioned unburning. The cyanobacteria are supposed to be the living things that created our atmosphere. 
you can't import oxygen from out of space. It's going to be dissipated. You can't use, uh, let's say, comets and bring in oxygen. You can bring in CO2, but you can't bring in oxygen. So you have to come up with some secular means of explaining how do we get oxygen because no breathing, living creature can live without oxygen, right? And so the theory is that these little primitive uh, one-celled creatures, if you want to call them creatures or plants, they, the little factories, unburned the CO2 that was in our atmosphere. Some of it came from outer space. And over millions, if not billions of years, created our atmosphere. That's the theory. Now, we can, I see George wants to comment on that. May and I, may I, Warren? Okay. Yes, the, if you look at the equation mm. for how does it go, carbon dioxide and water goes to oxygen and carbon, carbohydrate. It's in complete equilibrium. It's a reversible yeah. <coughs> reaction. It's reversible. And, and so if you make oxygen that way, the minute the organism is destroyed or disintegrated, it uses up the equivalent amount of oxygen. So the only way you get any net oxygen, if you bury <coughs> whatever the organism, the organism does not have an opportunity to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. So... <coughs> You have to, if you go that route, you have to account for a tremendous amount of buried organic matter. Um, we do have a new science book, by the way. Hmm. Kind of has geology. We have a new science book. <laughs> and it, yeah, we have, we now have a new, we got it two years ago. And, and uh, yeah, it has some geology in it. Just thought you'd like to know. Comment over here. I just want to say when um, um, a good illustration for creation is toys, especially Legos. And um, when I had an opportunity to teach my students how to build cars out of Legos, and we made the cars out of Legos, and the students programmed the Legos to, you know, do certain functions. The car moved backwards and all kind of stuff. But it took us time to make the vehicle. It took us thought. We had to look at diagrams. We had to think about it. Those Legos pieces didn't fly together on their own. If the school blew up, the Lego pieces might have gotten to a little close together without burning up first, but they wouldn't have orientated themselves in the right position at the right place at the right time then, once the vehicle was made, somebody had to sit down, design a computer code for it to actually work, and it had to make sure that it had batteries. All I'm just saying is that if I look at that lab desk right there, I know somebody designed it. I don't know who the manufacturer is, maybe if I walk around the back, I know somebody, a body designed that. I know good and well that it didn't fly together I know good and well that the tabletop, somebody chose that tabletop, cut it to the right dimensions. It was put together by thought, action, deed. Somebody had to think behind that. I look at that tail of whatever creature that is. I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know what the tail of, is. That a, That's looks a chameleon. Like a but it's a what? Chameleon. 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 Okay. That was designed. And it's more complicated than that table. There's no way, way something could have flown together. And it's just making a curling tail. That's another mathematical property, just the shape of the tail alone. You had to think about that to make it alive, to make it work. And God gave the gift of life. I know that we can, I guess... Uh, I know you all are scientists, PhDs, and stuff like that, but it gets to a point where it's more than just carbon atoms. It's more than just equilibrium constants. It's more than just physical, hmm, 
physical aspects, it is God himself is the spark of life. It gets to a point where we can't explain that part of it. And the Bible talks, and that's an area that the Bible talks about. Man, God breathed into man, and man became a living soul. If I had all the parts to make a body, if I had all the parts to, let's say, get it going, would they all turn out like Cain and then wind up killing themselves because they don't know the God of Creator? And then who would we have left? I'll comment down here. Yeah, sorry. I just thought uh, Warren mentioned uh, as you go down the Grand Canyon, you have radiometric dates, and they tend to be older the further down you go. Uh, and uh, this is this is you know what we find there. But I sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> and we find some that are way off. True. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, when you look at those layers at the Grand Canyon, they are so extremely parallel and so extremely widespread, there is no way you could develop a Grand Canyon under present conditions on our present continents. Erosion is way too irregular. Or even in our present oceans, they're pretty irregular at the bottom. Well, the, there's some plain, abyssal plains there are, but the, this stuff in the Grand Canyon is not deep ocean stuff at all. Yeah. Uh, you can tell by the fossils it isn't. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the fact that where you have these gaps missing, they're remarkably flat, uh, contacts. Uh, there's data that challenges these radiometric dates is what I wanted to say. Well, right now, we're, we're not even talking about how long it took. But what we're suggesting is that there was a creator and that it was an extremely intelligent creator. And furthermore, that creator likes life and likes varieties of life because that's what he made. Um, now, the, the book won't go on to do this, but, but I will a little bit here, and that is to say that once you have a creator, then figuring out how long he took is far more dependent upon knowing the mind of the creator than it is on knowing what nature can do without the aid of any intelligence. And so uh, there's a certain sense in which the kinds of limitations that are put on uh, uh, nature behaving itself normally really don't completely apply to how fast things could happen. I suspect that uh, as this picture develops and it's, you know, uh, these cells are getting so much more complex than they were 10 years, 20 years ago. They're not getting more complex, it's, we're just finding yeah, out. It, <laughs> Uh, you're, you're right there. Uh, that uh, the issue, I suspect, may develop into one. It's not going to be a question of whether there is or there isn't a God. It's going to be a question of time, a question of the Sabbath. Uh, did God create in six days? These will become the salient issues. Uh, more so than uh, whether there is a or isn't a God. I, I, I think sooner or later the scientific community is going to have to, to bow down to this data. Yeah, I think, it will, I think that will happen. Uh, George right. and Warren, and, uh, and then I think I'm going to let it go at that because we're kind of running a bit late. As, as we continue discussing this topic, eventually we're going to have to ask the question, did God create machines? Are we and is, are all the living organisms are sophisticated biological machines? And are we talking about a materialistic version of creationism? There is a, yes. I, 
I have a feeling that by default we have been implying that that is the case. And unfortunately, I don't think it's correct. And we have some evidences that we are not simply machines. Well, but that, that is another matter. And the implications are profound as to the relationship between the creator and, and the created world. Did, did the Lord create, and then the created world is operating autonomously, or is there a sustaining power that we are dependent on? Yes. Uh, I, uh, that's, that's one that we've actually covered a little bit in class, uh, and, uh, and I think you can show that the, uh, the use of the brain as a computer is insufficient to cons to take care of all the data that's there. And uh, there isn't enough storage space, even under optimal assumptions. But that's a question for another day. Right now, I think what we can be comfortable with is, yes, God actually exists and he actually can do things, including create life of various kinds. Yes. Um, I wear two hats in many ways. Part of my training, most of my training was in um, Christian institutions, but I do um, have training at Michigan State University, and, and you hear the secularist model there. And so when I say that let's take the time scale the secularists give to us and let's turn it around and use it as an argument, against, you know, uh, evolutionary origins, the first living cell, I think we have a powerful case. I'm not saying, of course, that we need to go that far. Mm -hmm. But, in but some you're saying case, that, uh, that even using that as a limiting case, it still isn't good enough. Yeah, even if we, and he does some of the same things in his book, uh, allowing for, well, there are certain things that uh, may be, chance could explain, but if you go a bit further, chance cannot explain them. Right. So we always have to make a few concessions. What I find is a gap. You know, we talk about gaps. Dr. Roth mentioned the gaps in the geological record. There's a gap between now when the first living cells are found on Earth, and they're about two billion years. We keep Scientists are pushing them back. It's now at two billion. It just came out in the last few weeks. Uh, and then you have the first complex life that's about half a billion. I said 530 million years. Yeah. You know, it's pretty close. You have a 1.5 billion year gap of nothing developing from these primitive cells. And then furthermore, you've got to preserve them the algae, cyanobacteria is a form of algae. You've got to preserve them multiplying, multiplying, multiplying billions of generations until we have them today. And they're just as complex today probably as they were back then. So there's a huge gap between the first life and the complex life stasis. We talk about equilibrium stasis. Things have been preserved. There's stasis there. And try and explain that with a secular model. Just impossible. I think we had one comment here. Are you going to pass? Go ahead, if you want to talk. Uh, let's get a hand in the mic. And then, or we'll give you the last word after that. There we go. If, if we believe that evolution is true, then uh, by necessity, the Bible must be false because the Bible de declares that death is the result of sin. Right. But if evolution is true, then death existed before sin, and therefore it's not a possibility that sin is uh, the culprit in charge of death. So either the Bible is true 
for evolution is true. They, they are mu mutually exclusive. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, last comment here, and then we'll close it. And come back next week, and we'll uh, <coughs> pursue the subject a little further. Uh, you want to uh, examine the f lower fossil record that Warren was talking about uh, carefully. I can't tell you for sure how those fossils are there. I can tell you that at present there are billions and billions of bacteria living down there in those rocks. I can tell you that algae are known to be found in some of sedimentary rocks 600 feet down. Uh, there's a lot of transport going on there. You're talking about living algae. I'm talking about living algae. But when you find a fossil there, there's nothing that tells you that that organism was fossilized when that rock was formed. It may have been fossilized long after. Be careful. Yeah. Well, I think, we, I think that once you abandon the, the mechanistic story in all its permutations, I think you have to carefully re-examine uh, all of the conclusions that have been made. And in, in cases where they use an evolutionary scenario as one of their foundational assumptions, then you have to question that. Uh, and, and you have to reconstruct it using different assumptions. Anyway, come back next week and we'll have some more fun.